Okay, class, let's move on. Um, I, I want to now um, start our study of the syllogism. The syllogism is one of the most beautiful and important inventions made by the human mind. And it was uh, invented by Aristotle. And over the years, um, logicians have refined it. And in your book, um, now I have the 15th edition of the logic book. So um, this, this book is really worth keeping. So <clears throat> this is chapter um, six. So chapters five, six, and seven is what you need to work on, okay? And we're gonna take, uh, and this is the study of classical deductive logic. Okay, and then the other part of deductive logic is called symbolic logic, and we're not gonna work on that here. So there's another course that I recommend you take. Um, Dr. Beach teaches it, and um, that's the symbolic logic class. Okay, so I want you to master chapters five, six, and seven of Introduction to Logic by the 15th edition by Kopi. Chapter five, I think I've talked about all the key points. If you listen to my uh, lecture and you read chapter five, I don't think you'll have any problems. Make sure you do some exercises and um, there are answers in the back of the book to the ones with the little asterisks around them. I left, in chapter five, I left out the immediate inferences. That's called the traditional square of opposition and conversion, obversion, and contraposition. These are um, immediate inferences. I, I bracketed those, and I, I want to come back to those when we move into the second part of our course, which is inventive thinking. Some of you were a little bit um, imprecise about the first two questions on the test. I just want to clarify that right now before I begin. <clears throat> You're making it more complicated than it is. For, for our purposes, critical thinking has to do with making evaluations or judgments about other people's arguments. And inventive thinking is simply inventing arguments, okay? So um, a lot of the things you said were close and I, I, I gave you points, half points for that, but, but it's as simple as that. If you're making a judgment about someone else's argument and you, you're in evaluating that argument, I call that critical thinking. If you're inventing an argument, that's inventive thinking. It's as simple as that. So part one of this class, which we're still working on, is critical thinking. And that has to do with making judgments about other people's arguments. So before we move into this syllogism, which I see as the essence of deductive reasoning, um, let me give you the whole picture. That way you'll have the gestalt as the whole, as they say, and then the parts will make more sense as we move through it. The whole picture is this. So what is logic? The study of the principles and methods used to distinguish correct from incorrect reasoning. So basically logic is the, is the development of critical thinking. Because what did I say about critical thinking? It has to do with making judgments about other people's arguments or the conclusions of scientific experiments, if it's, you know, or you're, what it is, the main thing is that you're making a judgment or you're evaluating someone else's argument. You're not inventing the argument. So all the examples in the logic book, for example, uh, the logician didn't make those arguments. Those are arguments already made by politicians, by scientists, by uh, theologians, by philosophers from, all the dis disciplines in all walks of life. So the logician's job is critical thinking. So I see logic as, logic is critical thinking. So now one kind of logic is deductive logic, and then there's inductive logic. We're not going to study that in this class. With deductive logic, we have two, two kinds of deductive logic. There's classical deductive logic, and then there's symbolic deductive logic. And I told you that symbolic deductive logic, which is all contained in this introduction to, to logic book, you know, that's for another course. 
So classical deductive logic, it means goes all the way back to ancient Greece, basically to Plato and Aristotle, but properly so-called it's Aristotle. It was already there in Plato and in pre-Socratic philosophers, but Aristotle thematized it. He made it into a, a discipline and now it was called the organon, the, the, the works, the works of logic. Okay, so I'm going to give uh, three lectures on the syllogism. And we've already uh, made our first steps into it. So we're gonna work on chapters five, six, and seven. So I'm gonna talk about chapter six today. So chapter six is called categorical syllogisms, okay? And it's called categorical because the premises and the conclusion are, con are containing categories, just like we talked about in chapter five. So, but like, like I said, uh, let me give you the whole picture. The whole picture is this. We're talking about critical thinking. So in life, you're going to encounter people's arguments. And these arguments are gonna be embedded in or what, the, what logicians call ordinary language. I like to call natural language. Why is it called ordinary language or natural language? Because it's not in standard form. That's not how people talk. If people talk that way, we would sound like robots, like cyborgs. But um, people speak in a natural way. And some people who develop their linguistic skills become excellent in speaking and they gain eloquence. That's the ideal. And the study of eloquence is classical rhetoric. That's a whole different subject, but it's related. So in ordinary language, in natural language, sometimes we encounter arguments. Now, some of those arguments start looking like deductive arguments, but they're not in standard form. They're just embedded in ordinary language. So what logicians have done is they found ways of taking these um, deductive arguments that are embedded in ordinary language, in natural language, or even at its highest level in eloquent language, and they've, they've given us methods to translate them into standard form. Okay, so chapter seven, which I want you to study carefully, later, at, right after this, is all about how to take arguments from ordinary language and translate them into standard form. Now, why would anyone want to do that? Well, it, the reason is, if they're not in standard form, then there's no way of testing to see if the argument is valid or not, okay? So the big picture is this, we go through life, and we have to make evaluations of other people's arguments. And sometimes it's very important when it comes to voting, for example, or you know, how, what do you believe about certain important things? Some things are simple and some things are more important, like what food to eat. You know, we go through life and we have to make changes, uh, choices. And some choices are more important than others. So we have to evaluate arguments. That's called critical thinking. Now, some of these arguments are deductive arguments, but they're embedded in ordinary language. So we need to take those, we need to find some methods of translating these, or these deductive arguments that are embedded in ordinary language into standard form. Then once they're in standard form, then we can, there are methods for testing the validity of these arguments. And we talked about validity. Validity means that the conclusion follows with absolute necessity from the premises, that the premises provide conclusive support for the conclusion. Or another way of saying it is, if you accept the truth of the premises, then you have to accept the truth of the conclusion. So that's, that's what's so beautiful about the deductive reasoning. That's chapter seven, but I wanted to put that out for you now because this is the big picture. I wanna give you the big picture so it makes sense to you what we're doing. 
uh, and then we can build it from the inside out. But I wanted to give you the big picture. That always helps to, they talk about the gestalt. Gestalt is a German word, which means the whole, the skeleton of something. So if you can get the, the big picture, then all the parts make sense. I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You, know, you can put all the parts together, you never get to the whole. So, um, or do you ever hear people say, you know, you miss the forest for the trees? That, you know, if you're literally, if you're standing real close to one tree, you can't see the forest, right? So if you can stand back and then you see the whole forest and then, uh, so the whole idea is that what we try to do, what I try to do uh, in thinking is to get the whole picture first and then when the parts all will, will make sense. Like if I just say, ba, ba, Ba. That doesn't make any sense. But if I say ba 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 bam, bum 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 bum, now it makes sense because I have the whole symphony, Beethoven symphony in my head. Okay, so here's the whole picture. The, the big picture is this: we go through life, we encounter arguments in spoken word, in the written word, in the news, every in every sphere of human activity, and we're asked to make judgments about those. Now, one kind of of the judgment is this, if it's deductive, it's either valid or invalid. So we have three ways of testing the validity of deductive arguments in classical, uh, we're, we're dealing with classical deduction now, not symbolic. And I'm gonna go over all three of them with you. The Venn diagram method is one. The second one is the rules method. Uh, you just memorize six rules, and if it breaks any of those six rules, it's invalid. If it doesn't break any rule at all, then it's valid. And then there are the coined named method. There are these names, the, and these, there are 15 names that these monks generated in Latin, people's names. And the, the, uh, the vowels of these names represent the mood and figures of these valid syllogisms. So, but that one doesn't tell you too much. That's just a quick way of finding the valid ones. But I'm gonna go over all three for you. The best one is the Venn diagram, but the other one is good too, the rules method, because it teaches you more about the syllogism. So, but, um, so that's the big picture. And then, so you, you, you encounter arguments, deductive arguments embedded in ordinary language. You have these methods, that's chapter seven, of uh, translating them into ordinary, into standard form. And then we have these three ways of um, determining whether or not these arguments are valid or invalid. Okay. Now there's another part of the uh, of critical thinking that logicians don't deal with, and that's determining whether or not the premises and the conclusions are true or false. That's up to your ed your education. The better educated you are, and the the more wisdom you attain in life, the better you are at determining whether or not a statement corresponds to reality, okay? And there are disciplines that deal with that. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Metaphysics is the study of reality. But um, this is not a course in epistemology or metaphysics, but I'm just telling you the, the question of whether or not a proposition is true or false that's an empirical issue. That's, that's going to be based on your education. So if you're well-educated, you're better at determining whether things are true or false. Like if the whole scientific community says that global warming is a fact, you know, then, and, and you have some trust in science, although there are biases here and there, but the whole scientific community saying global warming is a fact, then you probably sh should trust the statement that the forest fires and the extreme weather is to a certain extent exacer is exacerbated, you know, ex exaggerated from um, global warming. I mean, so you have to use your common sense. But logicians are not concerned about that. And that's not what we're going to be working with. But that's an important element of critical thinking. Remember, we did made a distinction between soundness and validity. So an argument is valid. Even if the premises are all true, some of you missed that in the, the premises could be all false. The conclusion is false too. And the whole thing is still valid. 
validity is just a formal, it's just the reasoning process is correct. But the truth of the propositions may be false. So that argument is not sound. Remember, soundness means the premises are true, the conclusion is true, and the whole argument is valid. So soundness is a quality that pertains only to deductive reasoning. So we want to, when we invent an arguments, the best thing you can say about an argument is that it's sound. And then it has to meet these two criteria. It has to be valid and the premises and the conclusion have to be true. But I'm telling you the truth or falsity of, the, of propositions, be they premises or conclusions, that's an empirical issue. That, by that I mean, that's not the purview of the logician or it's part of critical thinking, but it's not what logicians do. Logicians are concerned only about the reasoning process. Let's go back to the definition. Logic is the study of the principles and methods used to distinguish correct from incorrect reasoning. They're dealing with the reasoning process. Whether or not the propositions are true or not, that's going to depend on your education and your common sense and your good judgment, which you develop through time, through learning from experience, from thinking, by asking questions, by being humble and listening to people. And then as time goes by, you get better at determining whether or not anybody's proposition corresponds to reality. And you can check, you know, they're fact checkers. You, know, you can check the facts. After somebody says something, you can go and check the facts to see if it, you know, what, what the authorities say about that. Okay, so the categorical syllogism. That's the big picture there, okay? So now, okay, forget about chapter seven now. We're gonna, we're gonna start from standard form and then we're gonna go later. The next step is to learn how to translate it into standard form. So let's, so now, um, okay, we learned about A, E, I, and O propositions, right? And I wanted you to learn this, make a square. Learn it this way, and it'll be easier as time goes by. And you can forget about the square, but learn it this way, and then wean, your, wean yourself from that. Make a square in your mind. In the top left-hand corner, put the letter A. That comes from the Latin word affirmo, and it means all S is P. Okay. S is the subject of the proposition, and P is the predicate. I'm just reviewing what I already said last time. And then in the right-hand corner of this square, put E, which comes from the word nego, N-E-G-O. They took the E out and means no S is P. That's an E proposition. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, some S is P, okay? They call it an I proposition from a firm only they took the I out and use that as a symbol instead of the A, some S is P. And then the bottom right-hand corner, no, uh, some S is not P. S and P's are subject and predicate. Now you can instantiate any class into those S's and P's, okay? S can mean anything. P can mean anything. This is just form, okay? So you have A, E, I, and O propositions. Now a standard form categorical proposition, this is, after we translate it from ordinary language and we get it in standard form, it's gonna have a particular structure. It's gonna have a mood and it's gonna have a figure. And there are 64 different forms of the standard form categorical syllogism. But of those 64, only 15 are going to be valid, okay? So what is a, mo what is a mood? But before we go into that, let me say something more about the structure of a standard form categorical syllogism. Perhaps it's better if I give you an example and then we examine the example. If I say, no hero is, is a coward. No heroes are cowards. And then I say, some soldiers are cowards. And then I conclude from that, therefore, some soldiers, are not heroes, okay? Now that's, that's an example of a syllogism and it has some content and it's in standard form. 
It's not an ordinary language. People don't talk that way. But it's taken from ordinary language. It's translated into standard form and it has content. It says, no heroes are cowards. Some soldiers are cowards. Therefore, some soldiers are not heroes. Okay, if you, add, if you examine that syllogism, you're gonna see it has three terms or three categories or three classes, okay? We call them terms, classes, categories. It has a subject term, a predicate term, and a middle term. Now we're gonna add the middle term. The middle term is symbolized by a capital M. The predicate term is symbolized by a P and the subject term is, is a S, capital S. So if I wanna put that syllogism into symbolic form and abbreviate it, I can say no S is, um, I'm sorry, no P is M, Some S is M, therefore some S is not P. Now, where did this M come from? That's called the middle term. The middle term is what mediates. It's what provides for the inference from the premises to the conclusion, okay? So in a standard form categorical syllogism, there are three terms, subject term, predicate term, and middle term. And what we do is we look for the conclusion first. So this one is pretty obvious because it says the word therefore, therefore some soldiers are not heroes. The predicate term of the conclusion is called your major term, okay? So if I say the conclusion is Therefore, that's not the, the conclusion is some soldiers are not heroes. So heroes is the predicate term of the conclusion, right? By the way, is that an A, an E, an I, or an O proposition? Well, it's an O proposition, right? It says some S is not P. Some soldiers are not heroes. So heroes is P of the conclusion. Now the predicate term of the conclusion, that's called your major term, okay? And whatever other proposition contains that, that's gonna be your major premise. That has to go first. There has to be a certain order. That's why, you know, the, he has a whole chapter based on how to go from ordinary language to standard form. So the first thing to do is find the conclusion. When you listen to someone, just ask yourself, what are they concluding? What is their claim? That's why I had you distinguish between an explanation and, a, and an argument. With an argument, somebody's claiming something. They're making a claim. So try to find the ultimate conclusion of whatever anyone's saying. Then find the predicate term of the conclusion. So in this case, therefore, some soldiers are not heroes. Heroes is the predicate term of the conclusion. And soldiers, then, is the subject term of the conclusion. So how do we put it in standard form? These three, there's three propositions. How do we know which one goes first, which one goes second, which one is the conclusion? You take the, you have to use your common sense to find the conclusion. You know, you have to use your ingenuity, your abilities as a thinker to find what is this person concluding? Then you go to the predicate term of the conclusion. That's going to be your major term. Whatever other proposition contains that, that's going to go first. So since no heroes are cowards contains the word heroes, that has to be first. No heroes are cowards. Okay. Then you look to the subject term of the conclusion, which in this case is soldiers. Whatever other proposition contains the subject term of your conclusion, that will be your minor premise. Some soldiers are cowards. And whatever is left over then, the word cowards, that's gonna be your middle term. 
So we say, so now it's in standard form. No heroes are cowards. Some soldiers are cowards. Therefore, some soldiers are not heroes. Now we have three terms. Soldiers, or heroes is your major term. Soldiers is your minor term. And cowards is your middle term or categories. Now, there's two qualities of a syllogism, two more qualities of a syllogism. It has to be in standard form. The major premise has to be first. What is the major premise? That's the proposition that's supporting the conclusion, and it contains the predicate term of the conclusion. That's going to be your major premise. Okay? You just have to remember all this. You know, this, this is wrote for me because I've been doing this for so long, but it's not really that hard. You find the conclusion, find the predicate term of the conclusion, whatever other proposition contains that, that's going to be your major premise. You put it first. And then if you find the subject term of your conclusion, that's called your minor term. Whatever contains that, whatever other proposition that contains that, that's going to be your minor premise. And that's going to, you have to put that second. So the one that comes first, that's called your major premise. The premise that comes second is the minor premise. Then they usually draw a line and that's called the conclusion. Okay. Now, standard form categorical syllogisms are also have a mood and a figure. You can see words take on meaning in different disciplines. The word mood com meets com something completely different in logic than it does in ordinary language, in ordinary language, a mood is like today I feel sad, you know, I feel angry, I feel cantankerous, you know. There's all kinds of moods people have, romantic. Uh, I mean, a you know, whimsical mood and silly mood. I mean, there's all kinds of moods. In logic, there's only um, the mood is this. You take the we know about A, E, I, and O propositions, right? So you just take the major premise and find out is it an A, an E, an I, or an O proposition. And you, and you write it down or you remember it. So in this case, no heroes are cowards. That's an E proposition, right? No S is P. But in this case, it's not, cowards is not a P, it's an M. It's a middle term. So it, but it's still an E proposition. It says, no P is M. Because we know heroes is P because the conclusion of that, syllogism, the predicate term of the conclusion is heroes. So that major premise, no heroes are cowards, turns into no P is M, because cow cowards is the middle term. Okay, then you go to the minor premise and ask yourself, is it an A, an E, an I, or an O proposition? So you look at it, some soldiers are cowards. Well, that's an I proposition. It says some S, or it says some S is M. Because soldiers is the subject term of the conclusion, so that has to be your minor premise. And that's gonna be, the, the, the proposition that contains that is your minor premise. So that's an I proposition. So the first, the major premise was an A, uh, it was an E. The minor premise was an, is an I. And then the conclusion is, therefore, some soldiers are not heroes. So you have to find out, is it an A, E, an I, or an O? Well, it's an O. Some S is not P. Some soldiers are not heroes. So then you just list those three letters. The first letter is the major premise. The second letter is the minor premise. The third letter is your conclusion. So that's called the mood. Every syllogism is in a mood. And there are 64 syllogisms. Only 15 are valid. And there are these 64 different moods. So no heroes are cowards, that's an E. Some soldiers are cowards, that's an I. Some soldiers are not heroes, that's an O. So what is the mood of that syllogism? Well, it's an E, I, O, E, I, O. That's the mood. 
but it, it's important that the letters are in the right order. The first letter has to be the major premise. Is it an A, E, I, or no? So in this case, it's an E. The second letter, this is important. They don't pass over this because if you get them mixed up, then the, the whole thing falls apart. Logic is like mathematics. Everything has to be precise, you know, so. Okay, so the letters have to be in a particular, the first letter is whether it's an A, E, I, or an O, and it's gonna be the major premise. The second letter, you know, you just list them. Letter, letter, letter. There's only four letters, A, E, I, and O. So the first letter is the first, is the major premise. Second letter is the minor premise. Third letter is the conclusion, okay? It's important because all this is gonna make sense later when we use, see, we're gonna take all this, what we learned from chapter five, six, and seven, and we're gonna translate them into, transform them into tools to actually generate arguments. That's the exciting part. So it fits together very nicely. Okay, so that's called the mood. Now, there's also the figure of a syllogism, okay? Figure. There are four figures. And the figure is determined on the basis of the position of the middle term. See, the conclusion is always gonna be S and P. It's either, gonna, it's either gonna be all S is P or no S is P or some S is P or some S is not P or, or yeah, or some S is not P. It's gonna be A, E, I or an O proposition. But there's no middle, there's never a middle term in the conclusion. And okay? the middle term is gonna be dispersed. It's gonna happen one time in the prem, the middle term has got to be somewhere in the major premise, and then it's going to be somewhere in the minor premise. But in the conclusion, there's no middle term. Okay, the, the middle term always is in the premises. And it's going to occur one time in the major premise and one time in the minor premise. So depending on the middle term, on the positioning of the middle term, that's going to determine the figure. Okay. If the middle term comes first in the major premise, and then in the minor premise, it comes second, it makes like an angle. Actually, there's a nice diagram in your book. In, in the 15th edition on page 190, it shows the four figures, and you, those four figures. So it makes like a W. If you can memorize this form, if the middle terms are, if the middle term is in the first position in the major premise, and then in the minor premise, it's in the second position, it makes like an angle like this, going from left to right, like, like the beginning of a W. If the middle term is positioned that way, that's called figure one, okay? See, my mind works visually and spa uh, spatially, so, but everybody thinks differently, but it, sometimes it helps to think about things spatially. If it makes like the beginning of a W, the, the positioning of the middle term, then that's figure one, okay? If the middle term is on the right-hand side, you, you have four terms, subject, or, you know, there's a, if the middle term is on the right-hand side of the square, then that's the second. Here, like, like on page 190. You just have to memorize this on page 190, those four, those four figures. See how the middle term is on the right-hand side in figure two? If it's that way, then it's figure two. If the middle term is on the left-hand side, like in figure three, then it's figure three. And then the last, if it makes like the other, the, the other side of the W, makes at an angle like that, then it's figure, Four. It just makes like this figure one, figure two, figure three, figure four. One, two, three, four. I think spatial. Just memorize that spatial structure in your mind. Then you have a, a mnemonic device for remembering the four figures. Okay, so what have we said so far? Well, a syllogism has a mood and a figure. And if you have the, if you know the mood and the figure of a syllogism, you have the whole structure of the syllogism. Okay. So let's say you have an A, 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 one. 
So A, 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 that's the mood. One is the figure. How does that translate in, into a syllogism? Well, let's see. What do you do first? Look to the conclusion. And you know it's an A, A, A. So the last A is the conclusion, right? So the, la the conclusion says all S is P. Now, anything can go in there, all S's and P's. And since you know it's a one, that means the middle term has to be on an angle, like the beginnings of a W, remember I told you. So, and you know that the predicate term has to be in the major premise. So that major premise has to say all M is P. Okay. How because how do I know all that? Well, I'm just, I just came up with a mood and a figure. This happens to be a valid syllogism. It's called an AAA1. It has a name, Barbara. B-A-R-A-R-A. A-A-A. -A -A. And we just have to remember Barbara goes with figure one. So as soon as you hear the word Barbara and you see those three A's, you know it goes with figure one. You just have to remember that then you know it's valid because Barbara is valid. And Barbara is AAA1. And how does that translate into a syllogism? Well, the conclusion is all S is P because that's the last A. And the predicate term has to be in the major premise, right? That's your major term. And you know it's a one, so you know it can't come first because the M has to come first. So the first major premise has to say all M is P. And then you look to the conclusion again, find the subject term which is S, whatever you want to, whatever that is. In, and then, you know, it's an A proposition. So, and you know, the middle term has to be on the bottom right-hand side because it makes like a W in figure one. We're talking about figure one. So it's going to be all S is M. So figure one is all P is M, all, all M is, uh, P. All S is M, therefore all S is P. Now, no matter what you instantiate into S, P, and M into that, you can put any term in there. They have to be the same. You can't change them. S has to stay S, P has to stay. <clears throat> like, let, let's give an example. If I say, let's say I wanted to argue, um, that uh, music makes you smarter. So music is my conclusion and things that make you smarter is my con conclusion. Music is the subject term of my conclusion and things that make you smarter, activities that make people smarter. That's the predicate term of my conclusion. And that's an A proposition. I mean, all music makes you smarter. Practice of music makes you smarter. So what I mean is all practicing of music makes people smarter. I saw that on a bumper sticker and actually it's proven, it's a true statement, they've, they've proven it empirically. Okay, so that's my conclusion. And let's say I wanted to make that into, it's an AAA1. So if I say um, whatever stimulates the corpus callosum makes you smarter. Music stimulates the corpus callosum. Therefore, music makes you smarter. So that's, the exam that's, that's a, a valid syllogism. I think it's sound too, because but we're not worrying about soundness now. Remember, soundness has to do with it being both valid and all the premises and conclusions are true. But it, it's valid. It's a, it's a A, 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 one, because I say all, things that stimulate the corpus callosum make you smarter, make people smarter. So all M is P. M music stimulates the corpus callosum. Therefore, music makes you smarter. So that turns into an AAA1, where the conclusion is things that make you smarter, 
and the, uh, the, the predicate term of the conclusion is activities that make you smarter. The subject term of the conclusion is music. The middle term is whatever stimulates the corpus callosum. So since music stimulates the corpus, whatever stimulates the corpus callosum makes you smarter, mu music stimulates the corpus callosum, therefore music makes you smarter. Um, so that's a valid syllogism, but it, it, it takes the form, the mood of that syllogism is an A, 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 and the figure is one. So all A, 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 one, syllogisms, no matter what you instantiate into that, it's going to be valid. There are 15 of these. There's an infinite number of valid syllogisms, but if you just reduce it to the structure of it, the skeleton, there's only 15. But then there's an infinite number of those because you can instantiate it. It's like there's only 12 keys of music, but you can put those two notes together in, in an infinite number of ways, but there's only 12 keys. So major keys, and then there's 12 minor keys. So, you know, there's structures, and then those structures can be instantiated an infinite number of times. But in terms of the structure, then, there's only 15 valid syllogisms, and the AAA1 is, is an example. So on page um, 191, uh, at the end of 6.1, Kopi and, his, and the other authors, they, they have like uh, 10 examples. They do one for you and give you the solution. And what they're asking you to do, well, let, let me read it out loud. And you should be able to do these now and work some of those. You have to work some problems, otherwise this won't seep in, okay? So what is he asking you to do on page 191? Rewrite each of the following syllogisms in standard form and name its mood and figure. And here's the procedure. He gives you the, first, identify the conclusion. Remember I told you. Second, note its predicate term, the predicate term of the conclusion, which is the major term. Remember I told you that. Third, identify the major premise, which is the premise containing the major term. Remember I said whatever other pro proposition contains the predicate term of the conclusion that's going to has to go first. That's going to be your major premise. And then what's the next? Verify that the other premise is the minor premise by checking to see that it contains the minor term. You really don't have to do that because it's the only other one left. But look to the minor premise of the conclusion and whatever other proposition contains that is going to be your minor premise. And that has to be second. Rewrite the argument in standard form. Major premise first, minor premise second, conclusion last. Sixth, name the mood and figure of the syllogism. So that's all I've been talking about now. And I gave you the example about music. 6.2, he talks about the formal nature of, sil of syllogistic arguments. And you, I want you to read that. And he gives you some examples. But don't, don't, worry, don't worry about 6.2. Let's, let's not worry about 6.2. All right. So I'm going to stop there because um, the next one is going to be the Venn diagram technique for testing syllogisms. So all of I talked about now, I gave you some background information about this. We're studying deductive reasoning. There's two kinds of deductive reasoning. There's classical deductive reasoning. That's what we're going to work on. And then there's um, <laughs> then there's symbolic deductive reasoning. That's a whole. It gets a lot more, even more sophisticated. I kind of like I like them both, but that turns more. It turns into like a calculus, but it's not calculus because it's still connected to language, so it's still logic, but. Um, that's called symbolic logic. We're gonna work on classical deductive reasoning. So we're gonna work on chapters five, six, and seven. So now I just talked about, I, I gave you half of chapter five, but I bracketed the immediate inferences because that's really inventing arguments and that goes in part two of our course. And what I've talked about now, and I gave you the whole picture, the big picture is, you're going to encounter argu arguments in ordinary language. We have to learn to translate those into standard form. So that's chapter seven. That's coming up. But so now let's begin already with standard form, kind of. It's, it's almost in standard form. 
you know, he's taking you in baby steps. So what's the procedure? Find the conclusion, find the predicate term of the conclusion, and whatever other proposition contains the predicate term of the conclusion, that's your major premise, and then find the minor, uh, find the subject term of your conclusion, whatever other proposition contains that, that's your minor premise, and then so you have a major premise, minor premise, conclusion, and then name its figure and mood. The mood is simply the, whether it's an, is the, you just write down A, E, I, or O for the major premise, and then A, E, I, or O for the minor premise, and then A, E, I, or O for the conclusion. So it's going to turn into A, whatever. The, there's 64 different combinations. But remember, the first letter, whatever, be it an A, E, I, or no, that's your major premise. And then the second, your minor premise, the second letter is your minor premise. It's a symbol of your minor premise. And then the third letter is your conclusion. That's important. And then there are four figures. First figure, second figure, third figure, and fourth figure. And the, the figures are, it makes like almost like a W. If it goes from, if the middle term is positioned from left to right, then that's figure one. If the middle term is on the right-hand side of the, then it's figure two. If the middle term is on the left-hand side, it's figure three. If the middle term is moving diagonal from, uh, from right to left, then it's fourth figure. Okay, so you have to, if you have the, if you have the mood and the figure of a syllogism, that's everything you need. And then you have to remember about this process of instantiation. That's important. See, the, the process is this, you go from ordinary language to standard form. And then from standard form, you go into symbolic standard form. Okay, so you're moving from content to form, from ordinary language to standard form, and then the abbreviation of that standard form where you bracket the content completely. You just have all S is P, or you know, all S is uh, all M is P, all S is M. Therefore, all S is P. That's an A A A one, and you can put whatever you want in there. So what we, what we try to do is go from content to form, and the more you can get it into this is an important point actually. It helped. The more you can, the further you go into form, the easier it is to manipulate the logical manipulations. So we're trying to get away from content. In, in critical thinking, you're getting away from content, you're moving to form, you're losing all the nuance of language, you're, you're getting it into this skeleton, and it's in standard form. Now, in, so you lose all the meaning of the, you lose a lot of the meaning of this, whatever anyone says, but what you get is the reasoning process. And now you can make, it's very easy to use one of these three techniques for testing syllogisms, then diagram the rules and the coined name method, and then boom, you can determine whether or not it's valid or not. And if it if it's invalid, then you can point out the invalidity. If the reasoning process is could, could be all all the premises could be correct, the tr the conclusion could be cor uh, true, and the whole thing is invalid. So the argument has no shouldn't have any persuasive power because the reasoning process is invalid. Remember, we're trying to determine correct from incorrect reasoning, okay? If it's invalid, then it can't be sound because in order for it to be sound, it has to be valid and everything has to be true. So this is, uh, the, proce this is the, the process of criti critical thinking. W what happens is, you know, as you, it's sort of like anything, as, the more you do it, it sort of seeps in and then your critical thinking gets better as time goes by, it sort of seeps in. Because you know, it's pretty hard to do this in, in real life, like people are talking or you're reading and then you have to translate it into ordinary language and, and then determine whether it's valid or not. I mean, people don't really do that in daily life. I, I don't know why not, I mean, I'm, but what happens is, it's sort of like when you practice a, um, in sports, you know, and you, you 
your footwork is a certain way. When you're in actual competition, you're not thinking where you're going to put your feet or anything. Or when you're playing, when you're improvising in music, you're not thinking I'm, I'm, I'm using this pentatonic scale over the modern minor seven flat five chord. You, you don't have time to do that. But, but the more you practice that thoughtfully, it sort of seeps in and then you just get better. You just start doing it without even knowing that you're doing it. So that's how this works a little bit. But at first, there's, at first you just take it step by step. You go from ordinary language, standard form, and then abbreviated standard form. I call that symbolic form. And then test the validity. And then, so, um, okay, I think what I would do now is to read chapters, uh, uh, chapter, uh, chapter six, 6.1, 6 6.2, and go ahead and start moving into 6.3. The Venn diagram technique, it's a, it's a skill and there's some tricky parts to it. So I'm gonna do a whole little lecture on the testing the validity. But learn about um, standard form, syllogisms, learn about the mood and figures. And um, remember there are six, there are six, there's only 15 valid syllogisms and there's 64 possible forms and there's an infinite number as soon as you start instantiating then there's an infinite number of syllogisms and don't lose that big picture copy doesn't give you that and that's i'm trying to you know say something in addition to copy or and try to help you in any other way i can because you already have copy explaining things so then what's my role well my role could be maybe to simplify things and to give you a little trick a uh, little uh simplify and give you different techniques for um, what we're doing. So he never, he never really gave you the big picture, the big, and then I did that for you. So that should make everything else make more sense. Okay, I'll, uh, there's a, I'll, I'll make another uh, lecture on testing the, the validity of syllogisms, which is part of the critical thinking process. All right, thanks.